on the mountain, in the valley, in the crowded streets, or the empty desert, in our hope, and in our waiting, we are Hey, Josh, do you have a place for you to attend church, worship anywhere? Yeah, I'm here, actually. You do? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I don't, I don't know where you go to church, but I go to this church called Connect, and uh, we're doing uh, Christmas Eve candlelight services at our church. And uh, You ever heard of Connect? Uh, no, actually. Um, you know where Gravelly Bluffs is, right? Yes. So, so um, it's south of the Bluffs on 141. You know where the Emos is? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. See, everybody knows where the Emos is, right? <laughs> Hey, our church is right by the Emos. We've been here for a couple years, and uh, I just want to invite you. We're having three different Christmas Eve candlelight services. Convenient times are just an hour long, and they're going to be a lot of fun. You think you might be interested in coming? Yeah. I'd okay. I mean, if you've got a church that you already go to Christmas Eve, that's fine too. But if you want to, you know, bring your family with you or whatever, um, they seem like they could need a little Jesus too. So uh, <laughs> it's going to be an awesome time. So I hope you'll come. See what I just did there? Just a little example. We've got hundreds of those Christmas Eve candlelight service invite cards on that back table. Hey, and Ronnie, um, you know the ones downstairs? There's this, those invite. Can you just bring all those upstairs? We got to get rid of all of them. Bring them all upstairs and uh, grab several of them. Give them to a uh, waiter or waitress. Give them out at McDonald's. Give them out everywhere. They're not worth anything to us to keep them as souvenirs. They're not worth anything, okay? So let's give all of those away and invite as many people as possible to our Christmas Eve candlelight service. It's going to be great. We're going to be in week three of God is with us, and we're going to be you know, doing the candle thing, so it's going to be awesome. And worst case scenario, we burn the place down, and we get some insurance money to build a new building. So it's all good. It's going to be great. And I'm really excited to watch that happen, and then some lawyer is going to use that against me. Um, no, it, it really is going to be a great time. We're going to be learning how God is with us at all times. Hey, didn't the choir do a great job today? I thought they did awesome. We've got, we've, we're singing Christmas Eve as well, but then we've got the 11 o'clock coming up. But we sang at the Missouri Eastern Correctional Center this past Tuesday. Yep. They let us rent out the gym. Yep. One person's excited. I like it. I like it. And, um. Hey, because of how many guards, the ratio to guards per offenders in the room, they could only allow us to have 150 in there. I was a little disappointed, but 150 guys came in. They were very receptive. They were very excited. And when I shared the opportunity for people to put their faith and trust in Jesus for the very first time, a third of the room stood. I mean, these guys really were receiving this message of Jesus and really wanting to turn things around. Uh, Another third of the men said, you know what, this was just what I needed. This was a shot in the arm that I needed. And you know, they got a chant going that Ronnie likes to do all the time. Jesus! They got that thing going. And so everybody, like that really does happen. And uh, man, it was just such a great time. So all of you that sang and, and played the band, and, and it was just great. The band had zero rehearsal before we set everything up in, in the gym. I, literally zero rehearsal. And they, Daniel and the band did just an awesome job. So we were so blessed. But we talked about how God is with us at all times. Last week, we talked about how God is with us in the valleys. And today, we're going to be talking about when God is with us during times of wandering. Do you ever feel like you're wandering? But let's take a look at our theme verse, which is uh, slide two. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Everybody say that with me. God with us. God with us. Us. That's what Emmanuel is all about. And that's what Christmas is all about. Christmas happened because we needed help. And God sent his son Jesus to come down and be with us. As I explained last week, we talked about the mountaintops. But the big idea was we get to know him on the mountaintops. Or, or we enjoy him on the mountaintops. Next slide, please. We enjoy him on the mountaintops, but we get to know him intimately 
in the valleys. Now, we all know what a mountaintop looks like, don't we? It's like when your t team wins a big tournament or a big game. You hit the game-winning home run. You score the game-winning point. That's a mountaintop. You, you get the gift at Christmas time that you've always wanted, or you get to watch your kids open up the gift that, that you got for them, and it's just so exciting. Or students and maybe teachers, you prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed for a snow day, and God came through. Not one. But two, if you're in the Rockwood District, but if you're in the Fox District, they call off for whatever. You got three, three snow days. I love it. Isn't that a great time? So that's a mountaintop, isn't it? When you, when you get the message, school is canceled. But we talked about the valleys. What does the valley look like when you lose your job? An illness that changes everything in your life or what feels like a broken marriage. Your spouse for, that you had loved for years and for decades all of a sudden just says, I don't love you anymore. Have you ever, uh, any, any of you all like, hey, somebody shut that door, by the way. Those of you in the back, I, I, I don't even know how you're hearing me. Yeah, I don't know why that door is open, but let's go ahead and shut that thing because it's super loud back there. Have you ever been in a, in a position where um, you, you've been hanging out in a big city? And uh, anybody like the big city, like big Chicago, L.A., you know, New York City? Anybody, anybody like it? Like two of you. I'm right there with you. So a couple summers ago, we went on a little mini vacation with our kids, and we decided we're just going to walk around downtown Chicago. We're going to go see the sights. We're going to do all this stuff. We're going to spend $100 on parking and then a bazillion dollars on all the other things. And what do the kids want to do? They want to go back home and look at their phone, right? Oh, I'm tired. Can we just get some food and go back home and look at pictures of what we're actually at? You know, I don't know. That's what kids want to do. So we, look at, we walk around for, you know, what, what is a couple hours, what may have felt like an entire day to the kids, but we had a really good time. We saw the bean and we went through the, you know, the park area and, and went through some of the different shops and all those cool things. And then it was time to go back to our car. And I knew very specifically where our car was. I saved the address. I was good. I saved the address on my GPS. So I get my GPS out and I start looking and we're walking between these buildings. And guess what? No service. We're in the middle of society, like so many people, so much technology, no service. So I walk in one direction, it says I'm going the other direction. And I go this way, it says, I'm, and then I get, hey kids, you get out your phone. Your service is a little different. They get out. We're, we're dumber than when we picked our phones up, right? Like, I mean, we, we don't know where we're going. And so finally we have to ask somebody and they help us figure out our way back to the car. A year goes by and Rebecca and I are working a, con or a, a conference in Chicago, and we have to park in this hotel parking, this you know high rise hotel, and it's like underground. And we got the address, and then you know, as soon as you go under that bridge and underground, it's like GPS is gone. So it's like, oh, now we got to just try to figure this out. Have you ever felt that way? I mean, you've been there, right? You've been lost on the road, you've been driving around. If some of you have better sense of direction than, than others, well. Man, I don't just feel that way like when I'm on vacation, but sometimes I, I get to where I feel that way just in life. Like I'm stuck. Like I'm, like I'm wandering. Like you're stuck in a job you don't want. You're trying to figure out, do I take a risk and end that job and get some different type of training? Uh, what, what do I do there? Or you live in a house you don't like or you want to sell your house. You're trying to figure out if you want to buy or rent or leasing. And you're like, I don't know. Do I want to stay in this house? Or I want to? And you're trying to figure it out, but you don't, you don't feel like where you're at is where you should be settled. Or you're dating someone, and you're like, well, he's somebody, but not really what I want. I don't want to be alone. Maybe that person is abusive. Maybe that person it has a totally different belief system than you do. But you stay with them because you're like, I don't want to be alone, but you're kind of in a wilderness. Maybe for some of you, you had a spouse pass away or someone very close to you die. And, 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 and after going through that... You, you don't feel like yourself anymore. You feel kind of displaced. You, you feel like you've lost your identity. Anyone been there? Where you're feeling alone, you're feeling lost, you're feeling disoriented, you feel like no one understands you. Or you just ask the question, is this, is this all there is in life? Because it's leaving me feeling very empty. Right now we're going to show our very first This Is My Story video. It was almost five years ago. Video quality is not great, but... Uh, we, we were learning at that time, but Amanda Boyd is going to share her story with you of how she felt like she was really wandering until she realized that someone helped her to find God. Let's check out this video. One of the greatest things I ever learned is that God loved me even when I didn't love myself. Growing up, my parents were...
who have had addictions in their life and things that just found them and they weren't able to be parents. And so I got moved around a lot and um, struggled with feeling lonely. I had two older sisters, but they both got married at 17. So it was just me. And with moving around, I went to 11 different schools in nine years. So I never had a great connection with a friend. And then I also, I just used sex as a way to feel, a way to feel love, what I was looking for, to not feel alone. I got into a relationship with a guy that I thought that I would marry, and he ended up hitting me, and he would hit me quite often, but it eventually got really bad, and honestly, I just really didn't care. The physical pain was better than the emotional pain that I had been feeling for so long, and so I just stayed with him. One day, my sister came and got me, and got me out of the relationship. So as I went and lived with my sister for a while, um, I just really was at my lowest point. I didn't have anything to live for. I thought about suicide quite often. I just didn't see any way out. Was I, anybody ever gonna love me? It was either leave me or hit me or cheat on me. There was never anybody just right there for me. And so my greatest aspiration in life was to be a stripper. So my outward appearance was always makeup and put together and I seemed like I had it all going on. I always had a smile on my face, was ready to go, but on the inside I was just dying. There was nothing left. I was just at my lowest of lows. And my sister had said, why don't you go out with this guy, Matt? So I said, sure, why not? And honestly, I was going out with him in the intention that I would have sex and that was basically my only reason for going out with him. We went to eat, and he quietly bowed his head and prayed over his food. And I remember just thinking, wow, this is pretty impressive. Apparently he doesn't know that I'm a sure thing. So that night when he took me home, he didn't even kiss me, and I was a little bit blown away by that. But I continued to see him, and we were together pretty much every day for three weeks before he finally kissed me. And by then we had built a friendship, and I think that was the first time I had ever really felt respect in my life was from that. Just him not pushing, even kissing up on me. I remember just thinking, I just want what he has. Spending time with him, I just thought, wow, he just has it all together, but there was something more about him. He didn't care to pray in front of people. And he didn't just respect me, but he respected everybody around him. I went to Christian schools and I saw the way that the teachers acted and the principal and I just always thought, wow, I never want to be like them because they didn't see a person, they saw their sin. And I just never wanted to be that judgmental person. And I didn't see that in that. And it made me see Christianity in a whole different way. So I remember one night just feeling like, I want what he has, but I have so much in my life that I don't know how to get rid of. And I just cried out to God and said, I'm done. I'm just done. I accepted Christ and decided that I wasn't going to do it on my own anymore. Matt and I got married. And we've been married now for almost 17 years. But just because I got saved and I got married to this great guy doesn't mean that I live a fairy tale life. I still live life like everybody else does. After we got married, we struggled with infertility. Then finally, after having our three kids, we found out that I had cancer. But one of the hardest things that I've struggled with was losing my dad. I watched my dad die a slow and painful death. And as I watched him do this, I didn't have my purse in there. Matt was working out of town during the week, and we'd been doing this for months. He was home on the weekends, but I still just needed him and missed him. I would go over and see my dad and lay with him and try and spend as much time with him as I could. So in the middle of the night, I couldn't sleep, and all I could envision is how my dad looked. I wasn't alone. There was nobody in my bed, but I wasn't alone. I would just pray and I would just say, please help me through this. Please give me some kind of strong strength that I know that I don't have that is of you. And I would just talk to him. And it was one of those times in my life that I realized Matt might not always be there. And I would always had my friend there. But I always had God there.
your spouse may not always be there. Your friends may not always be there, but something happened here. She realized that God was with her all the time. And it was, it was through that, that wandering that God used Matt to show her the way. And so this is where I want to introduce our big idea today. It's this. Your personal wilderness becomes a gift when it drives you to depend on God. Your personal wilderness, that feeling of wandering, not knowing what's next, uh, feeling stuck, feeling lost, it, it's a blessing when you can learn to depend on God. And I want to tell you about the story of Elijah today. We're going to be opening up our Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 19. We're going to start in verse 3. And as you're turning there, the words are up on the screen. Let me, let me give you a little bit of a scouting report on Elijah. Elijah was this prophet of God. He was an incredible man. God used him to do amazing things on Mount Carmel. Elijah experiences the power of God and shows it to everyone else. Elijah was on a mountaintop. There was this guy that did not like Elijah, and it was King Ahab. And King Ahab wanted Elijah dead. But King Ahab for years was trying to, to have Elijah killed, but he couldn't figure out how to do it. King Ahab had a wife, and her name was Jezebel. Anybody ever heard that name? Anybody name their kids Jezebel? No? There's a reason, because it's because of this woman in the Bible. Jezebel was one mean woman. And so Ahab can't get the job done. And so Jezebel's like, guys, women, you, you get this? Like, if you ain't getting it done, I'm going to get it done. Right? The wife's like, hey, I'm going to get this done. This is the exact quote. Jezebel wanted to see Elijah dead. She said this, send word to Elijah that this time tomorrow he will be dead. She was tired of him uh, quieting their idols and having all their prophets of the false gods killed and almighty God doing all these incredible things. They didn't like that because they liked their gods. They liked their idols. They liked their way. They liked it so much they wanted Elijah dead and Jezebel committed. She's like, by this time tomorrow, he's going to be dead. King Ahab had been going after Elijah for years, but as soon as the wife got mad, Elijah got scared. You with me, husbands? You don't want the wife mad. It doesn't work out well for us. So let's go ahead and read uh, verse 3, 4, and 5 of 1 Kings 19. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. There you go. Just a message from the wife here. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went on a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, which is a tree. He sat down under it and prayed that he might die. He's done. He's toast. He's spent. And what does he say? I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. And Lord, we thank you so much for just the idea of this series that you're with us. You're with us in the mountaintops. You're with us in the valleys. And Lord, we know now that you are with us in the wilderness. Lord, as we study this character of Elijah, I pray that we would be able to make connections with this circumstance, because God, I don't think this was just for three, four, five thousand years ago. I believe this message is something that's very relevant to us today. Lord, I pray that it would jump off the page. I pray your spirit would speak to us and call us out today. Lord, challenge every single one of us up. We pray this in your name. Amen. So Elijah leaves his servant. No big deal. But it says that uh, he runs uh, and he came. He comes to Beersheba and Judah. Now, here's the deal. If you take a look at the little Bible maps and do a little study. It turns out that this little jog that Elijah took was a hundred miles. That's how freaked out Elijah was of Jezebel. He ran a hundred miles in sandals. He didn't have cross country shoes. He didn't have the Nikes. He didn't have any of that. He ran it in sandals. And he was just on the mountaintop. And all of a sudden, just like that, he forgets. God's power, if he gets all the things God's done, and he's like, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it anymore. So he runs, he stands there, he sits under a tree, and he just prays that he might dead, die. And he says something that I'm sure that all of you have said at one point or another. I have had enough. You can handle so much, and then all of a sudden, you've had enough. Anybody in this room said, I've had enough? Okay, if you're a millennial, you might have said this, I can't even. 
I can't even, I can't even, I've had enough. That's what Elijah's saying. Maybe the relationships in your life are hurting you. They're not helping you and you've had enough. You can't even. Maybe you're raising children, little ones, toddlers, elementary age, teenagers, adult kids, and you've had enough. Maybe your boss is a huge jerk. I've had enough. Maybe financially, you just can't seem to get ahead. Something happens, uh, things are going good, and then you have a flat tire, your car breaks down, you got hospital bills, washing machine breaks, refrigerator breaks, your bathroom on the upstairs floods, the whole house. It's a mess, right? You hate your job, and it depletes you, but you just gotta play, gotta pay the bills. Or moms, dads, you make the best meal. The kids, you slave all day long on it. The kids don't say thanks. They don't pick up the dishes. They leave their plate right there. And then they race to their rooms before you can stop them. And then you turn into Jezebel and you say, by this time tomorrow, you will all be dead. Right? Like, you ever been there as a parent? Oh, by this time tomorrow, you'll be, you keep that up, you'll be dead. Let's talk about Elijah, the past miracles that he experienced. He stares down the king. He stares down an entire kingdom and defeats their idols. He sends, uh, uh, Ahab sends military forces against Elijah. One man, Elijah. The entire military forces. Elijah goes and hides out. You know what God does? He sends birds to come and feed Elijah as he hides. I mean, God is literally bringing food from birds. Elijah stares down 850 prophets of Baal. Elijah literally calls down fire from heaven, and it happens. Elijah prays that it rains, and it rains. This prophet has experienced God's miracles. He's experienced God's protection. He's experienced God's provision. But then one woman makes a threat, and he is scared for his life. Been there? In our humanity, we can handle a lot. But then just sometimes just that one little thing just, and it just pushes us over the edge. We can carry so many burdens, then all of a sudden that one thing, and I can't even. And we tend to, to do in this moment is we make a, fi- a, a foundational mistake. We misunderstand what's going on. See, what we think is that we're tired. Oh, I just need a rest. I, I just need a break. I need a day off. I need my bed. I need Netflix and chill time. I need another vacation. I need a spa day. I need a beer. I need another relationship. But the problem is you're not tired. You're depleted. There's a very foundational difference. See, if you were just tired, a nap would make you better. And if Elijah would have been just tired, a nap would have made him better. But sleep and rest isn't the answer here. And it's because you are a part of something or you're living in something that is sucking the life out of you and you don't know what to do. It's not being tired. It's being depleted. Dr. Henry Cloud, who's the author of a book called Boundaries and Necessary Endings, you should read his stuff. It's really good. He says this, you're not just tired, you're spiritually depleted. And this is what you need. You need to receive spiritual nourishment. It's not about rest. It's not about another break. It's not about another day off. It's not about another vacation. It's not about a spa day. You are lacking a real life experience with the presence of God. That's what you need. And Amanda, after trying all these other things and living a certain way and and, and trying to figure out, well, is is it another relationship? Is it this? Is it that? Finally experiences the presence of God and she realizes, even when things are going terrible, I'm not alone. That's why Jesus came, so that God could be with us, so that we could have a personal experience with God. What does it say in Psalm 23? David writes, He restoreth my soul. So many of us, we're not physically exhausted, we're spiritually depleted. And sometimes, we put ourselves in that position. Elijah runs. Instead of just waiting on God, he he runs. Now, you and I, we do that too. We get depleted. And we run to or from someone or something. We may try to rebound into a relationship after a bad breakup. We may take a job that God says, no, 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 don't take it. Then we realize it's not what it's cracked up to be. We may buy that car. We may buy that house. We we may buy that boat. We may buy that timeshare against the advice of God and wise people. And now we're stuck 
in a wilderness of not being able to get through the problems of our finances. This past Thursday, Tuesday, we went to the jail and did our program. But Thursday, I trained the guys and we prepared songs for their Christmas service, which was today. And so we, we prepared songs like Old Holy Night, and Silent Night, and Joy of the World, and, you know, all of those different types of songs. It was so fun to sing those songs. But then I realized, you know, these guys, they're in the wilderness. It's somewhat of a wilderness of their own doing, but they don't, they don't want to be there. Because they're singing the same thing about this. They're singing the same songs that we sing, acknowledging the same scripture that we acknowledge, but they won't be with their family at Christmas. Man, and it's just very sad, and it, and it kind of breaks you down. But, but what we can understand is, even when we feel like we're in a wilderness, whether it's our own doing or not, God's with us. Even if it's our own decision to run into a wilderness, guess what God does? He builds us up. He doesn't tear us down. Let me prove it to you. First Kings chapter 19, verses 5 and 6 says this. All at once, an angel touched Elijah and said, get up and eat. And here's Elijah, broken, messed up, in the wilderness, afraid of Ahab's wife. And it says, he looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. Sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is just rest in the presence of God. Elijah had done all these amazing, incredible things. And then all of a sudden, some woman gets mad at him and he's afraid. That doesn't sound like the Elijah of Scripture, does it? And there are times in our lives, in our behavior, we make decisions and we're like, well, that doesn't sound like me. Here is Elijah. And God begins to build him up. I want to give you three W's today while you're in the wilderness. Three W's. Ready for the first one? It's this. Wait. Wait on the Lord and rest in him. You might not like where you are. You might feel very unsatisfied where you are, but wait patiently. Waiting is the exact opposite of responding or reacting irrationally. When you want something so bad, when you want God to take you out of the wilderness so bad, sometimes we tend to try to grasp at things to try and fix it, but then we just find ourselves deeper in the wilderness. It's hard to wait when you want something so bad, but a harsh or irrational reaction makes it worse. You're tired of your job, you just quit. But now you don't have any income and you can't feed your family. Well, that's not the answer. You, you burn a bridge with someone. Uh, you sever a relationship. You're just like, I'm done with this person. As if that person is the enemy and it's all their fault. Or you rebound from one person to another or one situation to another. Sometimes you've got to wait and let God work and be patient. Let him work things out for you. And as Elijah begins to wait on the Lord, it wasn't by his decision, but God's decision, the Lord begins to lead and guide him. 1 Kings 19, 7 through 10. Check this out. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat. For the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Now, isn't it amazing, by the way? I mean, Elijah takes a nap. He wakes up and there's fresh baked bread and a jar of water right by his head. You might think that Elijah in the, in the wilderness and you might think, hey, uh, God's up to something here. Well, it needed to happen again. And then it says, strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him and said this. Check this out. What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? Ever found yourself asking that question? What am I doing here? So action step number one is wait. Action step number two is walk. Walk means start moving. You may not know every decision, but, but start the process. Start the journey. Don't just whine. Walk. As Elijah stopped and waited, the Lord gave him instruction. The first instruction, let's go on this journey. 40 days and 40 nights. And while he began to walk, and God began to speak to him, Elijah's heart began to open, and he began to start to see things clearly. That's why God could ask him the question, what are you doing here? Because Elijah started to see things more clearly. Now, for us, when you're in the wilderness, bad news. You can't just lock the door and turn off the lights. You can't just pull the covers over your head. You've got to keep moving. You have a family. You have people that you lead. You have a job. Uh, there are times to stop, but you just can't stay stopped. 
God will want you to start walking, and as you walk, he will speak. J.D. Greer says it this way, God is able to steer moving cars. If you're not moving, and you're just sitting there whining, God might not do anything. Have you ever found a, yourself in a spot where you ask yourself, what are you doing? It was in the midst of this walk, and, and then as he gets to the cave, God says, Elijah, bro, what are you doing? And then they go deeper in the walk. As now Elijah has heard from God, he's journeyed with God, and now he's going to pour his heart out to God, and he's going to whine. Okay? Any of us ever whine to God? I think that's totally okay. I would rather any of you whine to God than whine to anybody else. And God has the grace to handle your whine. He's got the cheese to handle your wine, okay? 1 Kings 19.10. He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. And I'm the only one left. I mean, can you imagine him saying these things? He's by himself. He's the only one left. He feels like he's doing the right thing. You ever get whiny voice? Come on now. You know you do. You hear your kids get whiny voice, and they, they may have gotten it from somebody. You never know. He's in a spiritual wilderness, and he's talking to God. He's pouring his heart out to God, which all of us should. But check this out. His levels of depletedness hamper his vision to the point where all he can see is the problems. You ever get to that point? Where all you can see is what's going wrong. You lose perspective. Oh, I'm in the wilderness. Well, maybe God's got me here for a reason. Oh, I'm in the wilderness. Maybe God's saving me from something. Oh, I'm in the wilderness. Maybe I need to regroup here. Oh, I'm in the wilderness. Maybe this time I need to just fast and pray and cut out all the noise and listen to God. But when you get so depleted, sometimes all you can see is the problems. You've been there? That's where whiny voice comes. Everything is wrong. Elijah forgot all the amazing things that God had used him to do. And all he could see are his problems. And he feels guilty. He feels shameful. He feels like God's leaving him hanging. Anybody relate here? That's what the wilderness can do to us. But let me tell you, whining is, is fine. Whine to God. But whining all by itself is not going to get you anywhere. You got to walk. You got to go on the journey. See, the good news is that with God, there is hope. The bad news is if you don't have God, if God isn't with you, then you're not going to have the proper perspective to be able to handle and walk through the wilderness. Why? The big idea, again, is your personal wilderness becomes a gift when it drives you to depend on God. And so after Elijah whines and God has the grace and the patience to listen, let's, let's just see what God does here. It says, the Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and wonderful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. Imagine this. This wind comes and it's so strong it shatters the rocks. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. So imagine, a wind, and then we've got an earthquake. In the, but the Lord, it says, was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, like up from heaven. Can you imagine how God doing this? But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. Earth, wind. And fire. Do you remember? <laughs> God brought all of those things. But he wasn't in the earth, the wind, or the fire. What was he in? He was in the gentle whisper. Because here's the truth. God was not in the remarkable, but he was in the ordinary now let's, let's talk about the birth of Jesus. God's children wanted a king to come to restore and get rid of the Roman Empire and, and have the kingdom of God on earth and fix all the problems. And then he comes in the form of a simple little baby. Why? So a simple, poor, carpenter little baby could, re, could literally relate 
to every single person in society. Isn't that amazing? God came in the ordinary. We wanted him to come in the remarkable, but he came in the ordinary. God calls us. He calls us to wait. He calls us to walk. One more thing he calls us to do. He calls us to listen. He calls you to listen. I had to have another W. I'm sorry. And you won't forget it, will you? And I said listen like Elmer Fudd or something like that. Those of you that feel like you're in the wilderness, you're overcome by stress, the anxiety has you all wrapped up and locked up, God's voice seems so quiet that you can't hear, and you're saying, God, why don't you shout something from the heavens? God, why don't you do something incredible? Oh, Lord, why don't you just send a lightning bolt down to tell me something? Why don't you write something in the sky? Make something blow up, God. Cause this person to change their mind about life. But he chooses to work in the whisper. Now, why does God choose to work in the whisper? And why doesn't he just shout? Well, the answer is this. God whispers because he's always close. He's always close. Scripture tells us that if we have him in our life, his Holy Spirit indwells our life. And he is speaking. He's speaking through his word, through his spirit, through other godly people, through circumstances. The question isn't, is he speaking? The question is, are we listening? See, the media shouts. Politics shouts. Culture shouts. The devil shouts. God whispers. He doesn't want to shout louder because he wants to draw you closer. He wants you to have a relationship. Check this out. Psalm 139, 7, 8, 9, and 10. The psalmist writes, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. God is with you if you receive him. That promise is there. He's with you in the valley. He's with you on the mountaintop, but he also wants to be with you in the wilderness. I want to ask everybody to bow their head and close their eyes right now. Take a moment to reflect. Some of you today, you're in the wilderness. Maybe you didn't realize it before, but you feel stuck. You feel like your tires are spinning. You feel like you're not where you want to be and you're trying to figure it out. And God is saying, wait. God is saying, still walk. And God is saying, listen. Some of you, though, for the very first time today in your life, you realize that your plan isn't the plan that needs to be followed, but it's his. And just like Elijah, you run and you try to problem solve. But today, we learn that God's grace and his presence will go with us, but we must receive him into our life. And as I ask the band to come up right now, I want you to take a moment to uh, think about this. Some of you need to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ for the very first time. The way you do that is you pray with me a prayer, something like this. God, I thank you for bringing Jesus to this earth. I now understand why he came. I believe he died on the cross and rose again. And today, God, I pray that you forgive me of my, my sins. Forgive me of trying to follow and do things my way. And God, today I want to do things your way. Lord, forgive me. Come into my life and I want to follow you. Lord, thank you so much for saving me. Amen. If you prayed a prayer something like that today, did you know? That scripture says if you confess that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and you want to follow Christ, you're saved. So what does that mean? That means God's with you, that his Holy Spirit is with you today. The next thing that God calls us to do is to tell somebody. Like when you've made that decision, like I mentioned, I had the guys at the jail stand. It's a decision that you need to make and you need to tell somebody. Jesus says this, confess me before men. I will confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father in heaven. So when you ask Christ in your life, it's not just this little hobby. It's not this little personal prayer that you make. It's something that's very real that should make a difference in your life. And the people in your life should know it. That doesn't mean they have to agree with you, but they should know. They should understand it. So today, if some of you have made that decision with your life, you can get that connection card out and check the box and say, I chose to be a follower of Jesus Christ today. Some of you, you're ready to go public and get baptized. Check the box and say, I want to be baptized. Some of you want to speak with a pastor or a counselor. Check that box. We'll get with you and we'll talk with you. We want to help do whatever we can to help you connect to the Lord through Jesus Christ. And again, I promise you, if you ask Christ to come into your life, 
He will do it. And then it's our call to wait, to walk, and to listen. I want you to take a moment to reflect as we sing this next song of how Christ is our cornerstone.